It was a cold and wet September day, 9 AD. Mist and drizzle covered three Roman legions and their followers traversing through the dense and rugged Teutoburg forest. Under the governor of the province Germania, Varus, his officer, doubling as Cherusky chieftain Arminius, organized the trek towards the Roman winter quarters. The column stretched from the vanguard all the way to the baggage wagons in the rear. The long line slowly marched on. Nobody suspected thousands of hidden eyes among the leaves and trees hiding under the cloak of nature, following their every move. What followed is commonly considered one of the most decisive battles in history. Around the turn of the millennium, Tiberius and several Roman commanders led brutal campaigns north of the Danube. The goal was to subjugate the loosely organized Germanic tribes living in the region. In 7 BC, Rome added the region to the empire as province Germania. However, subduing the tribes was difficult, especially because of the lack of centralization and administrative center to control the region. Not to mention the tribes' aversion to taxes and general distrust against the Romans. At the time, about a dozen major tribes and many smaller ones lived in the region. Some of them, like the Batavi and Cherusci, were loyal allies of the Romans. Others, such as the Marcomanni, were forced into an alliance by Tiberius. It took rough and ruthless campaigning, but around this time it seemed this new province was on its way to being properly Romanized. When in 6 AD, about a decade later, tribes unleashed a massive revolt in Illyricum, Tiberius left Germania with eight of the eleven legions stationed there. Legate Publius Quinstilius Varus was appointed as its first official governor. A celebrated administrator, having served as a governor in Africa and Syria, he seemed like a suitable man for the region. An ancient source sums up his Syrian governorship as follows. He entered a rich province as a poor man and left a poor province as a rich man. With the strength of three legions, cavalry and an equal size of local auxiliary units, his army was still a force to be reckoned with. Aside from military strength, the Romans had a bargaining chip, a common practice to ensure the loyalty or at least subservience of tribes was to take children of chieftains to Rome and have them receive a Roman education. These boys became soldiers and, if talented, commanders. Among these boys was Arminius, born to a Cheruscan chieftain Sigimir. Valeia's description of Arminius survived a young nobleman, strong of hand and quick of mind, and far more intelligent than your average barbarian. The ardor of his face and eyes showed a burning spirit within. He had fought on our side and earned the right to become a Roman citizen. Indeed, he was even elevated to the rank of equestrian. Showing an excellent talent for military matters, Arminius distinguished himself by helping crush the revolt in the Lyrica. Attaining incredible prestige, Arminius next mission was to aid Varus in maintaining control of the new province Germania. Once arrived in the province, Varus ensured he became the new chieftain of the Cherusci. He married Thusnelda, the daughter of the previous Cheruscan chieftain Segestus. Though Segestus was a loyal Roman ally, sources indicate he opposed a marriage and bad blood grew after the couple eloped. Varus trusted Arminius blindly, but his protégé was planning a Germanic uprising behind his back. This was a challenging task as tribes weren't organized and often were traditional enemies of each other. Though his exact motivations are unknown, multiple factors likely caused Arminius' resentment. Some indicate he wanted to return to Rome, but was forced into his role as a chieftain. Seeing the heavy taxation on Germanic tribes and the brutal repression by the Romans was another. And as the adage goes, nothing unites a group more than a common enemy. Slowly but surely, the organizing of a widespread uprising against the Romans began taking shape. Arminius ensured Varus continued trusting and relying on him. He often asked the governor to resolve disputes between Germanic tribes, flattering his ego. It isn't like Varus was kept in the dark, as Segestus betrayed Arminius at one point. But Varus did not heed the warning and accredited it to a family dispute. When Segestus proposed Varus kept both him and Arminius in chains until the truth came out, the Roman commander brushed him off. It would turn out to be his undoing. In late summer 9 AD, the campaigning season ran to an end. 
So the Romans began preparing their annual trek towards their winter quarters on the Rhine. Arminius volunteered to organize the march, much to Varus's delight. As he was planning the trek, Arminius notified Varus of several supposed uprisings in the region. With the size of Rome's army, it would be an easy task to crush them. To do so, Arminius suggested a march through the Teutoburg forest, a densely wooded forest with hills and swampy terrain. Varus agreed, as Arminius knew the territory and would surely lead the Romans in the right direction. Varus ordered scouts to make sure the passage was safe to be sure they were not trekking into an ambush. But these scouts probably were Germanic auxiliaries who knew of Arminius's plans. Varus still suspected nothing. Things went just like Arminius wanted them to. As the Romans trekked through the woods, it became clear the terrain was not ideally suited for their military formations. The Roman legion 17, 18 and 19, some 18,000 soldiers straggled through the narrow paths. Usually Roman armies traveled in formation, but now they had no other option but to stretch the column thin and walk in lines of two or three tops. Traveling with them were 10,000 camp followers, family members, tradespeople and a lengthy trail of baggage wagons. Archaeological evidence of mainly Roman coins reveals the stretch of the Roman line was up to 20 kilometers in length. Deep within the Teutoburg forest, Arminius left the column. He either informed Varus he was going to gather more auxiliary units or was going to scout ahead. Trusting him, Varus continued the march. Little did he know, Arminius did gather troops, but not to aid the Romans. Instead, he took command of between 20 and 30,000 Germanic warriors who had gathered for the final showdown. Germanic peoples included Arminius's Cheruski, but also the Marsi, Chatti, Brugteri, and many more. The Roman column had to trek through the narrow, rugged area between the Great Bog, a swamp, and the Kokrise Hill. Due to the clattering of their equipment, no one heard the rustling of leaves as thousands of hidden eyes followed them. The Romans passed through the bottleneck. The vanguard passed with no problem. But with a part of the army in front and a massive row of baggage wagons behind, there was no room for maneuvering for the strung out position of the army. Still, nobody suspected their every move was being followed. Then, out of nowhere, loud thumbs, trees fell down onto the path. A barrage of spears and javelins filled the sky before crashing into the Roman columns. The damage of the surprise attack was enormous. The legionaries tried to take their defensive positions as well as they could while being pestered by missiles. The first significant cracks were already showing, especially because infantry armor was designed for close combat, not against sharp projectiles. And no melee fighting had even taken place yet. Soldiers panicked during the initial ambush. They had no place to run, but towards the north. Many of them fled into the swamp. Wearing their heavy kit, survival was nothing short of impossible. To the rear, where the majority of the army, the baggage wagons and Varus himself walked, nothing hinted at the disaster taking place in front of them. In fact, when the column suddenly stopped marching, their initial reaction was to push on. This only worsened the situation for those soldiers stuck in the ambush. Then a loud rallying cry marked the charge of hundreds if not thousands of Germanic warriors. The already battered Roman line certainly put up a fight, but fortune was not on their side. Some of them managed to push back certain parts of the Germanic line. However, these Roman soldiers soon discovered the constructed rampart between the hill and forest. It put them at a significant disadvantage and they were unable to climb it or get over it. Ferocious and merciless combat ensued on the narrow pathway between the bog and elevation, as the Romans knew they were fighting for their lives. To make matters worse for the Romans, rain began pouring down. It turned their heavy armor into their worst enemy, as being soaked with heavy equipment impeded their flexibility even more. Nevertheless, the lightly armored Germanics continued their hit-and-run tactics, retreating in the dense woods whenever the Romans gained the upper hand. After the onslaught was already going on for a long time, word finally reached Varus of what was going on. 
but he probably thought it was just a minor skirmish and gave the order for the rear to push forward to aid their fellow soldiers. But all this time up to 10,000 warriors had hidden on the eastern side of the Colchise hill. The Roman column now passed this contingent of hidden warriors. As they passed, these now charged into the column launching a similar surprise attack as had happened to the Roman vanguard. Ferocious and brutal fighting broke out, with the Romans being put on the back foot. A several kilometer long killing zone developed. The Romans in the middle and rear of the column broke rank, suffering similar fates as those in the vanguard who tried to flee in vain. Many drowned in the Great Bog, others were hunted down by warriors, hiding in the woods. As day turned into night, the Romans were still holding on despite the carnage. Some of them managed to push through the woods throughout the day, and finally, in the evening, a portion of the army reached a clearing behind the hill. Ferris ordered the establishment of an impromptu military camp in the woods. It is safe to assume nearly the entire surviving army was stuck in the woods. Those who tried to flee the woods were chased down by cavalry or rogue bands of warriors. Arminius held off the initial attack because he was familiar with Roman tactics. He knew that as they dug in, they would be able to fend off many attacks and cause a lot of casualties among his warriors. The night was quiet and several of the supply wagons even managed to reach the camp. But the following day, Varus ordered the burning of these wagons to speed up their advance and get out of the forest as soon as possible. As soon as the Romans left their encampment, however, the Germanic warriors continued their hit-and-run tactics against the column. Archaeological evidence does not reveal if the Roman column erected a new camp or retreated to their previous one. What is for sure is that during the second and third night, the Germanic tribes attacked the Romans non-stop. Somewhere during the onslaught, the cavalry broke rank, but it didn't matter as all of them were hunted down and drowned in the Great Bog. For three entire days deep within the woodlands, the slaughter continued. Barely any Roman soldiers managed to escape. Varus had been betrayed in the worst way possible. Seeing his situation as hopeless, he took his own life on the battlefield. A classic source attributed to Publius Aminius Florus described the aftermath of those Roman soldiers who decided to surrender. They put out the eyes of some of the men and cut off the hands of others. They cut off the tongue of one man and sewed up his mouth. And one of the barbarians holding the tongue in his hand exclaimed, That stopped you hissing, you viper. Following the battle of Teutoburg Forest, Arminius laid siege to Aliso, the nearby Roman fortress. The siege filled, but the Romans abandoned the region nonetheless. It is estimated nearly all Roman soldiers participating in the march were killed or captured. It was the single worst defeat of the Romans in centuries. Losing three legions meant the Romans lost over 10% of their military force. It was an enormous blow and an embarrassment to the mighty estate. It was the most significant defeat of the powerful empire that controlled territories from the Iberian Peninsula all the way to Syria. It not only put a dent in their prestige, but also caused far-reaching consequences. Emperor Augustus disbanded his German auxiliary bodyguard and ordered the levy to counter any invasion by Germanic tribes. The defeat marked the end of the Romans expanding to the north. The Rhine and Genoube now marked its northern border. But the expected Germanic invasion from the north never came. Arminius was unable to unite the Germanic tribes in the subsequent years. Still, the Battle of Teutoburg Forest would certainly not be his last battle against the Romans. It was a wet and cold evening in 15 AD. The Roman campaigning season was running to its end. Somewhere north of the Rhine, the Roman commander Cecina and his senior commanders pondered their dire situation. Local tribes surrounded their makeshift camp. For days, their retreat had been constantly hampered by skirmishes and ambushes. Most of his soldiers had not slept for at least two days, and during earlier fights, many lives and equipment was lost. Several men relived the Teutoburg disaster six years earlier, where Roman officer Arminius betrayed Rome and destroyed three legions in an ambush. From the dense woodlands, a pair of eyes kept looking at Cecina's camp. It was Arminius, and he not only remembered his victory six years ago, he was very eager to add another victory to that list. When in 9 AD news of the shocking defeat at Teutoburg Forest reached Emperor Augustus, 
he became panicked. He remembered the invasions by the Germanic Kimbri a few decades earlier. A united front of Germanic tribes could pose a significant threat against Rome itself. He called for volunteers, but when these did not answer the call, he instituted conscription. In total, he sent three additional legions to augment the northern defenses. Months later, as the frontiers were protected and any Germanic invasion failed to materialize, the Romans began planning their vengeance. In 10 AD, Augustus's heir designate Tiberius took up command in the north. Arminius too understood the Romans were a force to be reckoned with, especially when seeking revenge. But to his dismay, the direct aftermath of the victory of Teutoburg saw conflict among tribes take over. They were united in their collective hatred of Rome, but worked together anecdotally at best. In the next campaigning seasons, Romans invaded the Germanic lands without occupying them. Instead, they laid waste to any settlements they came across, intending to instill as much terror in the population as possible. There was no silver lining to the Roman campaigns, and without capturing too much booty, the campaigns were a drain of resources and manpower. This changed in 13 AD. That year, the supreme command of the regional armies fell to the young commander Germanicus, Tiberius's adoptive son. His name referred to his legendary father, Drusus, who commanded the first Roman armies invading Germania decades earlier. As Tiberius prepared for his new post in Illyricum, news reached him of Emperor Augustus falling ill. After a brief, turbulent period of succession, Tiberius succeeded the emperor. News of Augustus's death reached the legion stationed at Germania's border as well. Rebellions broke out about unpaid salaries. Germanicus acted fast. He increased the pay of his legionaries out of his own pocket. Then he launched his first campaign north of the Rhine. He used armies from both Germania Inferior and Superior. In total, this numbered around eight legions excluding auxiliaries. They invaded the territories of the Marsi and left an area of 50 miles ravaged with fire and sword. Defeating an ambush on their way back, the first campaign can be considered a moderate success without any noteworthy casualties or battles for the Romans. The following campaign season commenced in spring 15 AD. This year, Germanicus geared his attention towards the Chatti. The Roman army was split in two with Aulus Cecina Severus commanding four legions and 5,000 auxiliaries. Cecina was a tough and fearless leader with decades of experience. Germanicus commanded four legions and around 10,000 auxiliaries. The Chatti did not expect Rome's might and for days Germanicus ravaged their towns, villages and even their capital. Meanwhile, Cecina held the Cherusci and the Marsi tribes at bay. The Roman incursions rallied more tribes to Arminius' side, but one family member, his father-in-law Segestes, remained a loyal ally to Rome. Not being able to reach the Romans plundering the Chatti, Arminius' anger turned against Segestes. When he captured him at a certain point, Segestes sent his son to request help from the Romans. Germanicus wanted to encourage all dissent within Arminius' ranks. Saving Segestus would be a great victory for Rome and hopefully have many men follow his example. A flexible expeditionary force joined Segestus' son. Their surprise arrival led to a swift release of him and the capture of his daughter Thusnelda, doubling as Arminius' pregnant wife. This angered Arminius incredibly. Germanicus, meanwhile, ordered his army to raise the Bruteri territory. Doing so with considerable success, his army reached the site of the Teutoburg disaster six years earlier. Reportedly, Germanicus ordered the reburial of the remains they found, and there were plenty. Bones of men and horses littered the forest, bits of weapons amongst them. Many trees were adorned with pinned-on heads of those soldiers unfortunate enough to be sacrificed in that manner. After reburying many remains, the Roman thirst for Arminius' blood was stronger than ever. It just so happened that Arminius too was preparing for revenge. He managed to gather warriors from many tribes, even those previously thought to be pro-Roman. Besides several attempted ambushes, no decisive battle materialized as the end of the campaigning season approached. Germanicus organized the withdrawal from Germania. 
With half of his army, he set out to take a northern route and ordered Cecina to return along a trail known as the Long Bridges, or Pontus Longi. This famous route traversed through marshy terrain. Over the years, Romans built causeways and bridges to navigate the territory. It is safe to say many of these were destroyed, if left unguarded. With Cecina's army moving in that direction, Arminius knew exactly what route they were about to take. Taking shortcuts, he reached the bridges before Cecina. His warriors took their positions in the forest and on top of hills overlooking the marshes. Cecina's army numbered around four legions, 5,000 auxiliaries, and some levied locals. In addition, several baggage trains traveled with them. In total, the Roman army must have numbered around 30,000. Unfortunately for the Romans, the causeways indeed were broken down, either by nature or sabotage. To cross the marshy area, Cecina ordered his men to repair the bridges. He split up his army, with part of the soldiers repairing the bridges and others standing guard to cover the working party. Cecina was well aware of the vulnerability of his army, mainly because they were in a boggy plain hampering traditional army formations. His feelings were reinforced when small bands of warriors charged from the surrounding woodlands, pestering the Romans. Minor skirmishes at best followed. It went on like this throughout the entire day. Germanic bands of warriors would leap out of the woods or descend from the surrounding hills. They would throw javelins and stones or charge into the Romans. Using nature to his advantage, Arminius ordered his warriors to redirect a stream into the plain. With the water tide rising, the Romans had even more difficulty maintaining formations against the mobile and flexible German warriors. As night fell, Tacitus writes, several legionaries were already close to breaking. They built their camp in the plain. Still, they would not be able to sleep in their wet tents, knowing they were entirely surrounded. An atmosphere of uncomfortable dread hovered above the quiet Roman camp. Its guards saw smoke rise from the audibly celebrating German encampments. They knew they had the upper hand. The Romans knew it as well. The following day, Cecina ordered his army to form an infantry square around the baggage train. In theory, this was probably the best way to protect the wagons. However, the two vanguard legions moved at a much faster pace. As a result, the heavy wagons got their wheels stuck in the mud. Then, as the vanguard reached a wide open plain across the marshes, the baggage train was left exposed. Arminius, closely monitoring from a distance, saw the fault in Rome's formation. He ordered his warriors to charge and launched a massive attack against the wagons and the rearguard. The Germanic warriors clashed with the legionaries. There was no other way for the Romans but forward, and during the ferocious and brutal fighting across the marshes, the baggage train slowly moved towards the open plain. The unprotected areas were plundered by the warriors, who often chose to loot over actual fighting. Many soldiers decided to leave the wagons behind, instead focusing on getting themselves to safety. In the chaotic battle, Cecina's horse threw him off, and if it weren't for some legionaries thinking on their feet and protecting their commander, he would undoubtedly have been slain. After many casualties on both sides, only a few baggage wagons and most legionnaires reached the open plain across the marshes. The vanguard legions had already secured the plain and took their strategic positions. The Germanic warriors understood facing the Romans in open battle was a bad idea. In turn, they retreated to their woods. Although the Germanic warriors retreated, the Romans could not rest. They dug a ditch and constructed their base camp behind it. It was nothing more than a traditional square structure with four entrances and a rampart with the tents inside. As night fell, the Romans rightly were exhausted. They treated the wounded and it was surprising if a soldier managed to sleep under these conditions. After a horse broke free and caused a panic, even those who managed to get some shot eye were rudely awakened. 
Only thanks to Cecina's interference did he prevent a mass rout from the camp. Meanwhile, outside the camp, Arminius and other tribal chieftains figured they had already won the battle. Cecina's army was stuck without reinforcements in deeply hostile territory. The Romans had not slept for two days and the skirmishes wore down the discipline and morale. The chiefs had to decide how they would finish them off. Arminius proposed to wait until Cecina and his army marched through the thick woodlands again. But other chieftains disagreed. One of them, Arminius's uncle, suggested they let their warriors surround the camp and slowly close in. Arminius's tactic was overruled. The following morning saw a circle of warriors slowly move in on the base camp. Unfortunately for them, this is exactly what Cecina prepared for. All infantry were positioned behind the four gates within the Roman camp, ready to burst out and take on the fight. Cecina himself stood in the front line, raising the morale of his men. He kept his legionaries quiet until the warriors closed in. Then, when the warriors were close enough so that escape was nearly impossible, he gave the order. Trumpets sounded and battle cries filled the air. A constant stream of Roman soldiers poured from the four gates, charging at the surprised and confused warriors. Heavy combat ensued, with the momentum clearly being in Rome's favor. Many warriors were slaughtered during the hours of heavy combat. Nearing the end of the day, the battle turned more into a rout, with the warriors fleeing to the woodlands and the Romans giving chase. Although traditionally the battle was considered a Roman victory, Recent historical analysis argue it was more of an indecisive stalemate, especially because the Roman casualties numbered approximately one-third of their total army, not to mention the loss of equipment and animals. Cecina and his men did not suffer any more trouble on their way back to the Rhine. Germanicus also made it home safely, but not before running into a severe flood along the Dutch coast. And, well panic spread across the Rhine. Reports of a supposed Roman defeat reached outposts, and the standing garrisons nearly destroyed all bridges which provided Germanicus and Cecina with a safe passage. Reportedly, the only reason these bridges were spared was thanks to the interference of Germanicus's wife. The campaign season cannot be considered a success for the Romans. They suffered a considerable number of casualties, not to mention the loss of equipment and animals. Arminius remained in control north of the Rhine and did not suffer a defeat to unsteady his position. This status quo was unacceptable to Germanicus. The following campaigning season, he would surely take revenge against Arminius. This time, every soldier at his disposal would be put to use to once and for all avenge all those Roman soldiers who lost their lives at the hands of Arminius' warriors. It was the early morning somewhere in the summer, 16 AD. Germanicus and his officers were preparing for the upcoming battle. The Roman commander hoped this battle would be a decisive one. If everything went well, his soldiers would avenge the Teutoburg disaster several years earlier. During that ambush, Roman officer and Cherusky chieftain Arminius betrayed Rome and destroyed three legions in an ambush. Ever since, he has been leading a rebellion from the north. As the soldiers marched forward towards the Germanic warriors, a pair of eyes peered onto the battlefield. It was Arminius and his Cherusky warriors hiding within the trees. They were waiting for the Romans to engage in battle. In the winter months of 15 to 16 AD, Germanicus worked tirelessly to replenish his ranks. Instead of returning to Rome, he remained at his winter quarters along the Rhine, Together with his senior officers, he planned a campaign that would reach deep into Germania's territory with no other purpose but to force a final battle against Arminius. Germanicus attracted auxiliaries from the regions around the Rhine and received grain and animal shipments from Spain and Gaul. Cecina's withdrawal after the previous campaign season and the subsequent battle at Pontus Longi caused a significant dent in his troops. They lost approximately one in every eight 
soldiers. Not to mention other provinces struggling to adequately supply the costly campaigns. Pondering the strengths and weaknesses of earlier campaigns, Germanicus concluded logistics were the main detriment. Long marches exhausted his men, whereas the Germanic tribes felt comfortable hiding in forests, ambushing his columns, trekking through. Moreover, as had happened at Pontus Longi, baggage trains were an easy target for marauding warriors. A rather logical conclusion followed. Transporting his army by sea along the current-day Dutch coast meant a well-rested army could land in Upper Germania's heartland. However, one problem arose following this conclusion. He did not have any ships. So the remainder of the winter, his soldiers built a variety of 1,000 ships, clearing the dense birch and oak woodlands around Nijmegen. Besides constructing a massive fleet, they had other things going for them. Several high-profile defectors joined the Roman ranks. At the beginning of the campaigning season, 16 AD, the Roman fleet lay ready in loyal Batavi territory. The Batavi supplied a number of auxiliary troops before Germanicus sent out his fleet to sail north. He ordered several small army groups to take out potential troublemakers. He launched an expedition against the Chatti, rebuilt a structure his father erected decades earlier nearby the Teutoburg forest, and he relieved the besieged fortresses close by the Rhine. Then the fleet embarked, sailing upstream to meet up with the advance force. The advance force built garrisoned outposts north of the Rhine, securing a lot of the territory. His fleet arrived after a while, providing him with even more soldiers and equipment. So when news reached Germanicus of a rebellion among the Angrivari, he didn't worry. Surely, he would easily crush it. Part of his army sailed upstream the Weser River, disembarking in the troubled region. They swiftly crushed the uprising, plundering settlements as punishment. As a result, the rebellion did not spread, and Germanicus could finally focus on making inroads in the heartland of Germania. This also meant they entered Arminius' territory, making it his priority to know what was going on in his territory. Early on, scouts informed Arminius of the large Roman army marching along the river banks. Taking a large band of warriors with him, he set out to meet the Romans for what he understood would be a decisive battle. As Arminius and his army massed along the east side of the river, they saw the large Roman army marching up north. Germanicus commanded eight legions, augmented by auxiliary units. In total, the Roman army must have numbered at least 50,000 men. They set up camp near the riverbank. Arminius rode down the slope of the hill to the bank of the river, asking in Latin whether his brother was among the Romans. One man indeed left the Roman formation. It was his younger brother Flavus, who remained a loyal Roman soldier despite Arminius's rebellion. His face was marked with scars, and he lost an eye during earlier campaigns. When Arminius asked Flavus to join his rebellion, the meeting deteriorated into a shouting match. Reportedly, the Roman commander Stertinius had to hold Flavus back as he wanted to cross the river on his own to deal with his brother. The next morning, Germanicus sent a large cavalry contingent across a shallow part. Among them was Rome's Batavian cavalry commanded by its chieftain Chariovalda. To distract the enemy, they attacked the scattered warriors at the flanks. Meanwhile, in the back, Roman infantry began building bridges to cross the river. The fiercest combat erupted between the Batavia and the Cheruski. Initially successful and forcing the warriors to retreat, slowly but surely the Batavia were cut off from the remaining cavalry. Arminius gave the warriors fighting the Batavia explicit orders to lure them. They feigned a retreat, pulling the ferociously fighting Batavia behind a hill and forest. Then warriors ambushed them from the woods. Missiles and rocks flew down on them while men charged with their swords and clubs. The Batavi were surrounded. They put up a serious fight, and heavy casualties fell on both sides. The Batavi knew their only way to escape was to break through the warriors. They rallied in a circle and burst through the rear line of the warriors. As they broke through, Cheriovalda and his horse were slain. Thanks to their tenacity and the Roman cavalry keeping other warriors at bay, the rest of the Batavi managed to retreat. As the cavalry retreated, the Roman army finished the bridges and crossed the Weser. They set up camp at the riverbank, close by the plain. 
That night, a deserter from Arminius' side informed Germanicus he should expect a nightly attack. So the commander upped the security around the camp. But Arminius broke off his planned night attack when he realized the Romans were on high alert. Instead, a group of horsemen traveled downhill to the rampart, speaking fluent Latin. These men now yelled at the Romans within that if they were to defect, Arminius would richly reward them. The fact the man spoke Latin indicates several Romans already took this offer, but to Germanicus's relief, his legionaries took these suggestions as an insult. Instead, this offer was taken as a sign the Germans were weakening, morale actually increased. The following day, Germanicus deployed his army. He held a speech instilling strength and morale in his men. He reportedly saw eight eagles fly over his legions, a good omen. Then he ordered his army forward towards Arminius' army. The majority of Germanic warriors awaited the Roman army on a plain. Arminius and the Cherusci were on higher ground, positioned on a moderate slope with the forest in their rear. Although their exact formations are unknown, the vanguard of the Roman army consisted of Gallic and Germanic auxiliaries, followed by dismounted archers. For legions, two cohorts of the Praetorian Guard, the cavalry and Germanicus followed the auxiliaries. Four more legions of light infantry and horse archers manned the rear guard. The Germanic warriors were the first to attack the Roman auxiliary vanguard. Ferocious combat commenced. Subsequently, the Roman cavalry broke out of the formation and charged the flanks and the rear of the Germanic warriors. As the fury was going on in the plain, several Cherusci on the hill broke rank against Arminius' orders. They charged downhill, attacking the flank of the Romans. Predictably, the auxiliary cavalry swerved and flanked these Cherusci warriors. They did not stand a chance. The counterattack was quick and brutal. The Roman army continued pushing back the warriors and casualties on Arminius' side mounted. He had to act. He ordered his remaining men to charge into the Roman flank. He let the charge himself. The Cherusci heavily impacted the auxiliary flank, initially making inroads. During the melee, Arminius was wounded. As more auxiliary heavy infantry joined the fight against the Cherusci, they began falling in disarray. Tacitus detailed the disintegration of Arminius' warriors in his writings. The enemy was slaughtered from the fifth hour of daylight to nightfall, and for ten miles the ground was littered with corpses and weapons. The Cherusci were being pushed back from the hills. Arminius was conspicuous among them, striking out, and though wounded, sustained the fight with hand and voice. Before too long, the warriors were routed altogether. Arminius only managed to escape because he smeared his face with blood to avoid recognition. Some warriors, unfortunate enough to not reach the woodlands, could do nothing but run towards the Weser River. Tacitus writes, Numbers were overwhelmed in an attempt to swim the Weser, at first by discharge of spears, or the sweep of the current, later by the weight of the plunging masses and the collapse of the riverbanks. Some clambered to a refuge in the treetops, and while seeking cover among the branches, were shot down in derision by a body of archers. Others were brought down by the felling of trees. The Romans suffered very light casualties, but for now, the wounded Armenians escaped. Following the Battle of Idisaviso, the Romans celebrated their victory. Because Germanicus was the adopted son of Emperor Tiberius, the army held a parade in his honor. The battlefield lay littered with corpses and bits of weapons. The Romans used the weapons and wicker shields to create a mound with the names of the defeated tribes engraved in them. This mound had quite an adverse reaction, however. The sight of the trophy with the tribe's names enraged the warriors who survived. Although many of the battle survivors were preparing to leave their native lands and hide deep in the woods until the Romans left, they now organized among themselves once again. One more battle would follow, for Arminius and his allies felt the Romans overplayed their hand. This culminated in the Battle of the Angrivarian Wall, the final battle between Rome and Arminius. It is a cold and wet morning somewhere in early autumn, 16 AD. Arminius and his fellow horsemen are hidden between the trees, looking over their fellow Cherusci warriors constructing a rampart. 
Many were exhausted, and frankly, none expected to fight this soon again. After the onslaught at Edistaviso, many prepared to flee deep into the woodlands to wait for the Romans to leave Germania. But Arminius roused his warriors to fight against Germanicus one more time. This time, he altered his strategy to fight on his terms. Then, in the distance, he saw Germanicus and his army move towards him. This was his final chance. He had to make it count. Though Arminius's warriors suffered a pretty severe defeat at Edistaviso, they were fast to regroup. Arminius suffered several injuries during the previous battle. Initially, they wanted to flee into the woods and trek deeper into Germania's heartland, evading the Roman army until the campaigning season ran to an end. But Germanicus constructed a mound adorned with swords of their fallen brothers. The Romans considered the mound their trophy for their victory. Perceived as a brutal insult, this was one step too far for the warriors. The tribal chieftains agreed to wage battle against the Romans one last time. Arminius reasoned his previous defeats occurred because he fought the Romans on an open plain. In comparison, harassing Cecina at the Battle of Pontus Longi went well until his fellow chieftains decided to encircle the Roman camp on sturdy ground. The same happened at Edisaviso. Once again, they chose an area with solid ground to fight the Romans. The Romans had no trouble fending off the scattered, charging warriors thanks to their disciplined formation. Now, right after the Battle of Edistaviso, Arminius and his warriors marched along the river Weser to find a more suitable ground for fighting. After a two-hour march downstream the Weser, they reached a plain around the river Aller and an accompanying swamp with dense forests around it. Arminius ordered his Cherusci and Angrivari to construct a rampart. The warriors constructed a rampart, similarly to the trap which Ferris's men in the Teutoburg forest ran into seven years earlier. The construction forced any approaching army to take their chances traversing the swamp or climb the wall. His warriors stood by the constructed earthen wall while Arminius hid his cavalry in the nearby grove. If the Romans indeed decided to climb the wall, his cavalry was in perfect position to flank the struggling infantry. If they were to traverse the swamp, they would be even easier pickings. Arminius forgot to take one aspect of his plan into account. After his victory at Edistaviso, Germanicus ordered several scouts to trail the retreating Cherusci. These men now lay at a safe distance closely monitoring Arminius' actions. When they saw what he was up to, sending his cavalry into the woods and constructing the rampart, the scouts sent word to Germanicus. The commander understood these were no actions of fleeing men. They wanted to meet him in battle another time. He did not mind the chance of doubling his victories in the campaign. As he arrived at the location, he was ready to execute his hastily thought out battle plan. To Saius Tubero, his chief officer, he assigned the cavalry and the plain. His infantry he drew up so that part might advance on the level ground into the forest and part clamber up the earthwork, which confronted them. He charged himself with what was the especially difficult operation, leaving the rest to his officers. Germanicus lined up his army with archers in the front. Behind them stood three legions with Germanicus and his Praetorian guard on the right flank. Another legion guarded the rear of Germanicus. Behind them stood two units of cavalry. Far behind stood the reserves, four more legions and auxiliaries. They stood with their backs to the river and the swamp to their left. Germanicus wanted to divide his forces. The main part of his army was to attack the defensive wall, while he led a charge, circumventing the fighting. A few volleys of arrows did not put a significant dent in the Germanic lines. The infantry charged forward to the wall. The Germanic warriors pestered them with missiles and rocks as they tried to scale it. The infantry was already taking significant casualties. Germanicus ordered their temporary withdrawal and his slingers and archers forward. These began pelting the warriors behind the wall with rocks, lead balls, and launched arrow volleys. Scorpios, a Roman torsion siege engine and field artillery piece, shot missiles at the warriors behind the wall as well. After battering the warriors for a while, Germanicus ordered his infantry forward again, this time with more success. A few of his men climbed the wall and engaged in melee on the other side. 
The Roman infantry and warriors clashed. Brutal, heavy fighting broke out. Finally, more infantry leapt over the wall. This was the moment Germanicus had been waiting for. Together with his Praetorian Guard, he charged at the earthwork. But right before they reached it, they swerved to the right and charged into the forest. This took away all the momentum the hidden cavalry thought they would have. Arminius and his Cheruski were shocked to learn the Romans knew of their position. Due to the dense forest, neither side truly had an advantage. Usually, stationary cavalry was weak and at risk, but the Roman charge wasn't as ferocious as it would have been due to the dense vegetation. It was a messy and bloody fight. Germanicus himself fought among his men. Tacitus writes, In battle, he often engaged and slew an enemy in single combat. During the battle, he took off his helmet and rallied his men. He told them they would not take prisoners. Despite the Roman cavalry performing subpar because of the difficult terrain, seeing their commander fight on re-energized the Romans. Fighting took place on every front now. Arminius chose an area with many natural obstacles, which convinced him would prove the downfall of the Romans. Instead, as the Romans valiantly resisted his warriors, they ended up awkwardly with the swamp to their right and the wetlands in their rear. Germanicus's Romans had the earthwork, and river in their back. Retreating was nearly impossible for either side, it was a fight to the death. Arminius rode between his warriors attempting to increase morale and continued the fight. The clash continued all day, but as afternoon turned to evening and a day of heavy fighting was behind them, Arminius's wounds began getting the best of him. As it was getting dark, Germanicus ordered one of his legions in the reserve to construct a base camp to spend the evening. By this point, both sides were exhausted. It became clear, however, the Romans fared much better in battle. Exhausted and suffering from his wounds, Arminius estimated they would not win the fight and ordered the retreat. Together with the chieftains, they fled through the woods. Seeing their commanders run, the warriors deteriorated in a panicked rout. As the Germanic warriors broke, they could run nowhere but into the swamp, into the river, or into the wetlands. Either by drowning or by being cut down, they suffered incredibly heavy casualties. This was a severe defeat to Arminius, but he managed to escape, which was a bit of a blemish to Rome's victory. Still, Germanicus praised his men and raised an enormous victory trophy, a mound of weapons and armor. In its aftermath, he sent one of its commanders with a minor army to crush the Angrivari. Fighting was not necessary as they willingly switched to Rome's side, and other tribes were likely wavering in their loyalty to Arminius as well. By this time, the campaigning season was running to its end. It had been the most bloody season in a long while. Germanicus's army had to traverse quite a distance to reach the safety of the Rhine fortifications. His fleet could not carry all of them, so part of his army had to prepare for a dangerous journey over land. Those who did sail with his fleet ran into other problems. Germanicus received a costly reminder the Romans weren't traditionally seafaring people. The Marsi tribe reportedly described the aftermath of this naval adventure as their shores littered with corpses and debris. Germanicus miscalculated the Frisian tides and many vessels sank. Storms flung soldiers overboard or men were left stranded on uninhabited sandbanks in the Wadden Sea. Germanicus himself was briefly stranded in the territory of the Chauci. He led raids against the Marsi and Chatti. They reportedly wanted to ambush the stranded Romans. He successfully subdued the tribes and recaptured the eagle of Quintilius Varus's legions, lost at the Battle of Teutoburg Forest years before. When the weather calmed down, they finally returned to the Rhine fortifications. Even after this disaster, he was convinced he would destroy Arminius. Tiberius, however, was not eager to continue the costly campaigns north of the Rhine. Instead, he recalled Germanicus, who celebrated his triumph in Rome. Although the triumph was a glorious event, it also marked the silent death of Rome's vengeance against Arminius. Two years later, Germanicus died, likely poisoned. Arminius's fortune did not fare much better. With the existential threat of Rome gone, feuding among tribes rapidly escalated. Before too long, war broke out between Arminius' Cheruski and the Marcomanni, led by their king Marbod. 
But when the Chatti chieftain sent a letter to Tiberius promising him to defeat Arminius for a rich reward, Tiberius refused, stating, Rome is revenged on our enemies in the open by military force, not in the darkness by treason. Arminius ended up defeating Marbot. However, instead of solidifying his position, it resulted in an internal power struggle between him and other chieftains, like his uncle. In 21 AD, his own men murdered the 37-year-old Arminius. They felt he was becoming too powerful, which his ambitions to become king of all tribes likely affirmed. Tacitus remembers him, undoubtedly the liberator of Germany, a man who, not in his infancy as captains and kings before him, but in the high noon of its sovereignty, threw down the challenge to the Roman nation, in battle with ambiguous results, in war without defeat. He completed 37 years of life, 12 of power, and to this day is sung in tribal lays. 26 years after Arminius' death, the constant warfare among the tribes led to the Cherusci to request the Roman Emperor Claudius to become their king. In a fascinating course of events confirming my belief that history is often more exciting than any good novel, Claudius sent Flavus' son to be their king. This man, Italicus, was born to Arminius' brother, who continued serving Rome loyally after his brother's defection and rebellion. Thank you for watching this video. If there's a topic or event you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also really like to thank all my patrons and channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you already gain access to exclusive patron videos and early access to my videos. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.